Excellent. Well, we might kick off um, now that we've got uh, quite a number of our attendees in the session today. So thank you everyone for joining us on this session around how digital skills relate to Australian apprenticeships. Um, my name is Peter Scurgeons. I'm the director of the Australian Apprenticeships and Traineeships Information Service. Um, and uh, I'll be uh, running this uh, session today uh, with help from uh, uh, GAN Australian Apprenticeship Employment Network who are hosting us um, and with a number of our um, panellists as well. So before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the past, present and future traditional custodians and elders of Australia and to the continuation of cultural, spiritual and educational practices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, and today I'm hosting from the um, country of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. So I'd like to acknowledge um, them and uh, of course acknowledge that we are um, all from different lands around Australia um, joining today as well. Okay, so the session today, um, as I mentioned, we're talking about digital skills um, in Australia and um, in Australian apprenticeships. Uh, this particular um, session is based off of a report um, that Integrated Information Service, so the company that runs um, the Apprenticeship and Traineeship Information Service, um, has uh, completed um, in conjunction with the Apprenticeship Employment Network and GAN Australia. So this report we've been working on over the past six months um, and it was released um, earlier this year. Since then, Addis has been publishing a number of blogs um, on the topic. Um, so if you are interested in that report and in the blog post, we will be sending those around um, after the session or I do have the URLs up on the screen um, uh, that you can uh, to go to yourself as well. And if you do want more information um, about the content of the report or around the blog posts, I've also got the contact um, details of uh, Gary, Nick and myself up on the screen as well for any of you to get in touch with us. So we've got a number of panellists um, on the session today, which is going to be a really exciting um, panel session. So I'd like to welcome um, Gary Workman from um, AEN and GAN Australia. So Gary is the executive director at both AEN and GAN Australia, has over 20 years experience in the vocational education training uh, sector and has worked on um, numerous government industry projects um, around apprenticeships and a range of other um, sectors. Uh, we've got Dr. Mark Dean, who is the Laurie Carmichael Distinguished Research Fellow at the Carmichael Centre at the Fu Centre for Future Work at the Australia Institute, which is a very long title, and I'm sure I've got at least one or two words in that one uh, wrong, so apologies, Mark. Um, Mark was um, my co-author on uh, the full report, and I, when I say co-author, I should say lead author on that particular report um, when he was with Atis um, earlier this year and has moved up to uh, Chile, Canberra, um, possibly to get away from us. Um, also on the session today, we have uh, Beth Worrell from Microsoft. So she's currently the National Skills Program Lead at Microsoft Australia. But Beth, I do believe that you're moving into a new role uh, later this week, if that's correct, from my little bit of LinkedIn stalking. Yep. So beautiful. Congratulations on that. And uh, really excited to, uh, to see all of your work at uh, Microsoft. Um, and also on the session today, we have um, Dr. Kathani Neff, who is the Director of Digital Skills and Concepts at the Digital Skills Organisation. She's got over 25 years of varied and very exciting professional career experience within the Australian vet sector, um, particularly um, across technology, um, ICT and vet leadership and education. So we've got a really fantastic uh, group on board today who are going to um, talk everything around digital skills. So the way we're going to run through today is each panellist is going to give a bit of an introduction to their work. Um, and then from there, we'll go into a facilitated uh, Q&A. So I've got um, a few questions that I've uh, sent through to the panellists but ahead of time, but I'm also taking questions from the audience. So as each of the panellists are going through their introduction or as we're going through our Q&A, please do jump into the chat uh, with any questions that you'd like me um, to ask of any of the panellists. So really happy to take those. And then at the end of the session as well, we can unmute people's microphones uh, if you would like to ask any of our panellists um, questions as we go through as well. So um, as I mentioned, we are talking about digital skills um, in Australian apprenticeships today. In those blog posts that I have mentioned, we have been doing um, a range of uh, surveys and polls through those. And so we've been getting a bit of an understanding um, from people across the sector um, around what are the key issues um, that everyone's facing around digital skills. And some of these are really key elements that came out in the report as well um, around uh, issues around digital exclusion um, and social um, inclusion and disadvantaged groups. Um, of course, an issue that's come up a number of times is around the development of training products um, to meet industry needs and particularly around um, the time that it takes to get those products to market. 
Um, we've seen issues in careers education, so making sure that young people and the you know, future of the digital workforce um, have that education and understanding um, of what they may be able to do in the future. And then the last theme that we'll be exploring today is around innovation for Australian apprenticeships in the digital skills space as well. So some really key topics that we'll be touching on that have come up through the report um, and through those blog posts and polls. So I'm going to hand over to Gary to give us a bit of an introduction um, to the report um, and to AEN and GAN Australia's uh, work in the digital skills space. So Gary, over to you. Thanks, Peter. And right off the bat, I just want to thank yourself and Mark for all the work that you've done in this research project over the last sort of six months. So without your support, we wouldn't have been able to pull this together. Um, but the origins of the program really started probably 12 months ago with a, a conversation at, with the ILO and GAN Global. So GAN Global is made up of 17 different countries around um, the world. We're one of 17 nations that sort of try and share in best practices around workplace learning models and apprenticeships. And a lot of the countries are facing similar issues to what we were um, around the time COVID-19 was a relatively new thing for us in Australia, but overseas they'd already seen some fairly large reactions and restrictions and a lot of things moving into that digital space. And the conversation started with Microsoft, who have been a global partner of GAN and the ILO program for a number of years now. So, you know, Microsoft being a world leader in this space, we're obviously keen to understand well what impacts are COVID having in different parts of the world. And also a, a bigger story around, well, how are we going to start to embed digital skills in the range and the broad range of qualifications that we have for existing workers as well as new entry workers into programs like apprenticeships and traineeships in Australia. I know Beth's going to touch on some of the things that um, Microsoft Australia are doing here, but at a global level, Technology is moving really quickly. A lot of traditional industries are moving into that space as well. I know you've got some examples today looking at the automotive industry, for example, how they're moving into you know electric cars, autonomous driving, 3D printing, and all those sorts of other things. So you know, the conversation for us was around, well, how are we going to start to embed digital skills into the wide range of qualifications that we have here in Australia? And we know that the, the federal government have started the digital skills organisation, and that's running as a pilot at the, um, at the moment. I know we've got Ganthi, um, who's going to give us a little bit of update on what they're doing here. But from my perspective, it was more about, well, we have, you know, fifth, you know, 500 different qualifications. How are we going to start to embed digital skills across the various industries and make them relevant to those industries going forward? And obviously, from from our perspective, apprenticeships are key to the economy and how we're going to move forward in the future. So I know you've um, got a couple of slides that talk about the research re results. Um, the initial research was done in Colombia, New Zealand and Australia, and it was interesting to see between the three countries the issues and the challenges were fairly similar amongst the three as well. So uh, this isn't going to be an issue just for Australia. We, hopefully we may be able to learn some things from other countries as well, but thanks for your, your time today and we look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Gary. And I think that was something that we were um, not necessarily surprised about, but certainly going through the process um, and uh, reading the reports of the other couple of countries that participated, there were very strong themes um, across all three. And I think that's something that we thought maybe Australia was going to have some quite unique um, issues, but certainly a lot of those um, were really reflective um, across the board. So I'm uh, quite interesting to see how other countries are reacting in this space as well. So, well, I might hand over to uh, Beth now. So Beth, I know that Microsoft is doing a range of really exciting uh, work in this space, including the Microsoft uh, Traineeship Program. So would you be able to give us a bit of an introduction to you know, your perception on the Australian digital skills landscape um, and how Microsoft is responding to industry needs, both kind of inside and outside that formal education system? Sure, and thank you very much for that introduction and for having us today. We are really pleased to be able to share with you and with the group some of the work that we're doing in this area. Um, so as you mentioned, the, the Microsoft Traineeship Program is one of the, the key initiatives that I have been working on over the last three years. And it's in recognition that Australia has an IT skills shortage, digital skills shortage. So we have um, an estimated 
gap of 60,000 people per year for the next five years. And we need to kind of transition those people into the IT industry if we're to keep up with the demand. Um, I think COVID has exacerbated this situation further. Um, we know that people who have technology skills um, in specialist areas, but in generalist areas as well, are now 30% more expensive than they were last year because the demand for their skills is so much higher um, than, than this time last year. And also because Australia has effectively closed its doors to highly skilled migrants. So the, the demand for technology skills really hasn't been higher and there is an urgent need to get people into the industry with those skills and and place placing them into jobs and it's getting to the point where um you know it will have a bad effect on a range of organizations if they're not able to to meet that demand so the microsoft traineeship program is just one of the initiatives we have in place and that is basically a, a, a technology traineeship um so we've kind of looked at models from um the uk particularly, but other models here in Australia. And it's a um, an initiative that we're in the process of placing our 250th trainee um, in the next couple of weeks, working with over 70 employers across the country. And they take these trainees um, on into, into their businesses, into their organisations, creating an entry-level role for those individuals supporting them to acquire Certificate 4 in IT, um, as well as industry certifications, and um, most importantly, helping them get on the job experience, which is, um, is transformational in terms of their career, but also their lives. So many of these people had been previously excluded from pursuing a career in IT just because university was too expensive or they weren't able to commit to full-time education. So it's really a transformative um transformative program from that perspective. We've also had a big focus on um, increasing the diversity of those participants. So at the moment um, of the 250, we're sitting at about 40% female participation, 4% um, Indigenous participation, and all up about 75% uh, diversity participation. So we're really looking at this as a, an opportunity to increase the diversity of the IT industry. Um, but it's not just digital skills and IT jobs per se. It's a recognition, I think, that every job is a technology job going forward and um, no more so kind of as, as it's proven in places like Sydney. Um, Brisbane is in a four-day lockdown. Perth in a four-day uh, four lockdown. You know, having some level of digital literacy, some level of connectivity, is vitally important to all kinds of jobs because you, know, without that, we're really not able to keep the wheels turning. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about how we can make sure that people aren't left behind. And we have um, free digital skills resources available globally. It was launched um, about this time last year. In that time, we've reached 800,000 Australians with these free resources. So it is a, a recognition that Australians are investing in their digital skills and, and really looking to, to make those investments. But in terms of uh, apprenticeships and traineeships, the other kind of mega trend um, outside of COVID is this automation, the impact of automation and technology in key industries. And so there is a, a broader realisation now that um, you know, it's if it, no matter which industry you're working in, so it might be mining or agriculture, um, you know, these types of um, the, the impl implementation of things like um, automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning, drones, driverless cars, all of that sort of thing will impact every job and especially apprentices and trainees. And all of those types of jobs will touch technology in one way, shape or form. So I think Australia needs to, to really look at investing in IT skills for every apprenticeship. You know, even if you're bricklaying, um, chances are in the future you'll be doing that side by side with a robot or it may be that we print houses in the future. Um, we just don't know, um, what, you know what's around the corner, but we do know that technology skills are a basic form of literacy these days, and it needs to be part and parcel of just foundational education going forward. So that's it from me.
Beautiful. Thank you, Beth. And I think um, you've obviously hit on a, a few really key points there, but um, I particularly liked um, what you just said around, you know, every job is a technology job. And I know um, us here in Melbourne have certainly found that over the last um you know, a year or so, but um, I think that's something that's really key really across the whole VET sector is that um, digital literacy skills are absolutely vital um, across all um, apprenticeships, traineeships and, and VET training. Um, so I'll pass over now to um, Kathani. So um, Kathani, as I said, is at the Digital Skills Organisation, so a really exciting initiative from the federal government. Um, so I was wondering if you, you could go through, you know, the role of the Digital Skills Organisation and what kind of work are you doing to improve um, the VET system in relation to digital skills? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Just some um, taking on from what um, Beth talked about, you know, there, there are a number of challenges that um, the current technological landscape and the rapid acceleration that brings into um, our, our environment as well as significant opportunities. So uh, DSU um, um, you know, is looking at this challenge, um, one of these challenges um, and the opportunities and, and to well place us. Um, to take advantage of those opportunities. So one of it is, um, you know, just like Beth just articulated, um, digital uh, environment is going to impact every worker and every business. So DSO is, um, you know, really looking at how do we upskill um, the entire Australian workforce, including the new talent pipeline across every single um, industry to contribute positively to that digital economy. The economy is now digital. It is a di digital economy. Um, and um, therefore, uh, you know, uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, a project called Digital Fluency Project. Um, and the way we're going to do that is by defining what we call digital um, national skill standards uh, aligned to, uh, you know, different categories. So it's something very similar to what you talk in your uh, report about skills benchmarks and uh, where we can actually take these skill standards across various training programs, not just concentrating on ICT workers. So number one is this is set up to look at the digital upskilling rather than uh, upskilling only ICT workers. Having said that, um, there are a number of reports that have identified that uh, there's going to be a, a, a critical need for um, specialists, digital professionals uh, within the Australian workforce as well. For example, one of the reports claimed that uh, we need 150,000 um, digital professionals uh, you know, uh, across the next five years. So we also look at, uh, in addition to digital fluency pathways that sits across uh, every single area. We are also looking at digital professional pathways that also sits across a lot of other areas as well. For example, once we define the, uh, we, we're currently um, you know, uh, in, in the process of finalizing our first pilot project, uh, Train 100 Data Analyst. And when we actually did that project, we created those benchmark critical work skills that are required by anyone who's going to use that skill set uh, for data analysts, whether it's uh, it's someone who's working in an advanced manufacturing area uh, or who's working with artificial intelligence or somebody who's actually crunching numbers. It's that base set of skills in order to get entry into it and how we take those um, national skill standards that, that benchmarks um, that particular um, skill cluster uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's quite transferable across a number of industries then. Uh, the, and we know that the current uh, approach to digital skillings, when we actually look at the numbers, we know that uh, if we want 150,000 workers within the next five years, our, our supply from our universities, uh, big, um, sector and the you know, unaccredited training or whatever, it's not keeping pace with the velocity required um, uh, with the number as well as the type of skills. By the time the university graduates come out of uh, their course, the, the skill set has already moved. So um, the apprenticeships and that model, whether we were very keen to learn from that apprenticeship model and to actually take it forward into digital skilling right across uh, rather than to limit it to um, you know, saying um, apprenticeships uh, you know, in that manner. Um, and the other thing we want is employers don't really clearly understand uh, the value of digitally skills workforce. 
So it is um, you know, in our mission that we look at this end-to-end -end journey in digital skilling and employers, engaging employers as early as possible to take them, take them through that journey. Um, and, and uh, you know, we were talking to um, quite a few people. Uh, I know that Ben Barden is there. And uh, when he mentioned um, uh, the apprenticeships, and, and we had a discussion about how well the apprenticeship system um, actually looks after and, and have that employer engagement. So very keen to bring that across from, uh, you know, right throughout our digital um, skills training there. And we are testing that with our Train 100 um, project as well. Um, and um, and the lack of coherence across the sector. Again, your report talks about the state boundaries and, um, and various ways, the funding models. And um, Beth talked about, uh, you know, the challenges of implementing uh, traineeship programs across Australia. And we're looking at that policy environment as well. So a number of programs, number of projects, number of pilots that we are running to learn and refine the model. And we engage with a, with a really great uh, bunch of people people, uh, including industry, apprentice, um, um, you know, um, um, centers, uh, GTOs like MEGT, and uh, we had a really successful um, community of practice with the vet, uh, vet practitioners um, this morning. So you do a lot of consultation um, to move forward. Thank you, Peter. Excellent. Thank you. Wow, there is a lot going on there. And um, certainly I know we've been following um, a lot of what the DSO has been doing and just, um, yeah, really exciting projects. And um, I do know you are having a lot of consultation with the apprenticeship sector and um, uh, you've kind of jumped into our, our main topic today, which is around apprenticeships in the digital space. So uh, hold that thought and we'll, we'll definitely come back to that in a bit more detail. Um, we'll just, uh, before we get into any questions, I'll pass over to uh, Dr. Mark Dean. Um, so Mark is going to uh, run through some really um, uh, interesting slides that he's prepared. So we will send these out to everyone after the session today, um, looking at uh, beautiful digital skills relating to Australian apprenticeships. And I know that, uh, Mark, you're going to be touching on a couple of those industries and also the role um, that our training providers and particularly our TAFEs can play in this space as well. Yeah, thanks very much, Peter, and uh, thanks for uh, involving me today, everyone. Um, I'm broadcasting from the Ngunnawal country, so would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Um, so yeah, uh, I've I've uh, in my current role uh, since I've I've left Addis uh, and this report that Peter and I prepared, um, it's given me an opportunity to look a little further into some of the areas where I think there will be great demand for not only uh, digital skills uh, going forward, but also uh, opportunities for digital skills to to uh, develop a foundation and and address that digital divide issue that uh, Peter and I addressed in, in the report for GAN and Microsoft. Um, so uh, the digital skills that are needed in Australia, uh, I think two really great opportunities relate first to an emerging electric vehicle industry um, where we're already seeing digital transformations to automotive training packages, uh, including new units of competency, uh, particularly for uh, electric vehicle industries and uh, EV battery manufacturing, as well as uh, value adding to mining exports of uh, rare earth minerals. Um, so some of those uh, changes to training packages are currently uh, the pace for change has been made. So and as we've already touched on it, it does take a long time for those uh, plans to for, for those changes to come into effect. Um, so obviously we do need a lot more coordination and coherence uh, across the, the national system to make that uh, a quicker process. Um, but then I thought as well in terms of the digital divide, what a, what a really interesting uh, area it is uh, in early childhood education and care, where uh, we can see the real potential for digital skills for educators and care workers uh, to aid that digital literacy development from, from a very early age amongst uh, young Australians. Uh, so, um, of course, Beth touched on earlier the, the fact that uh, digital skills will be needed across just about all occupations. And uh, this will be a very important one because this will help to narrow that digital divide in those early years of preschooling and help people understand uh, that digital learning needs to start at a, at a very fundamental level to help people uh, develop into their, their lives and their careers. Um, and 
it's really important, I think, to stress the fact that uh, although there are a lot of great uh, industry and employer-led initiatives out there that we've we've already discussed so far in this webinar, TAFE is still a very fundamental core of the, the VET system. Um, and that's largely because it is the natural home of automotive manufacturing training and skills development. Um, it always has been. And uh, the CERT 3 in automotive EV technology is, uh, is a case in point of how that uh, will, will feature as a, as a potentially enormous way to revive uh, automotive manufacturing, at least uh, component supply chains in Australia into the future. Um, but also in terms of uh, training and skills development for, for early childcare and education and, and, and uh, the way that CERT 3s and uh, diplomas will be in high demand over the next uh, uh, decade and, and more as, um, as we, we see hopefully a growth in population um, and, and uh, the role that TAFE can play in, in helping to drive uh, the skills and training in that, in that industry. And um, overall public provision, um, if, we, if we think of TAFE in terms of a public provider, uh, we should also be looking at these industries as, as key growth sectors for uh, the economy and, and how to help us recover from the, the post-pandemic uh, and move forward. Um, so yeah, uh, my favourite newsletter that comes out every Monday is uh, the TAFE Directors uh, newsletter. And uh, this was just from uh, yesterday. In fact, uh, Craig Robinson, the CEO of TAFE Directors Australia, talked about how uh, TAFE, um, you know, uh, the way that we need to think of skills as uh, being uh, not always profitable, but, but often necessary. And I think digital skills in these two particular industries are a case in point. Uh, and as Craig says, this underscores the rationale for public provision. TAFEs operate for the benefit of the state, its industry and its citizens, not the bottom line, which perils public investment in private entities. So that's why I do think that there is still a, a huge role for, for TAFE to play in helping us adjust to, to just how critical skills uh, in, in digital areas will be for all occupations and all industries and sectors moving forward. Um, so in terms of some of those initiatives, I think that uh, where vet skills are a pillar of industrial and social policy, um, TAFE should become the public institution at its centre. Uh, this will definitely help to bridge the digital divide that requires investment in, in public institutions. And like I said, rebuilding in the post-pandemic environment um, could, could really mean decommodifying some of that skills development and helping to smooth out some of those issues with the coherence uh, between funding models and different state systems. Uh, and, and not just seeing everything as a new market opportunity. So some of those skills we need to invest in as a public good and, uh, and, and help to, to achieve that um, outcome that's not going to reflect the, the rather grim outlook that the intergenerational report uh, has, has shown us uh, yesterday as well. Um, so that learning with, with you know, deep learning with digital technologies um, will be a major part of this uh, building digital competencies uh, in, in, uh, amongst Australian learners in all stages of their development. Uh, instead of just delivering those job-ready outcomes. Um, so that's that's all for me at this stage, but uh, that's that's some food for thought, hopefully. Beautiful. Thanks, Mark. And I've seen we've got a, a couple of co um, comments popping up as well, which um, I will be monitoring the chat throughout the session today, and I will be looping back to a couple of these points as well. So something that I wanted to um, get started on um, with... Oh, beautiful. Um, get started on today um, with these questions is around the digital uh, divide and, and social inclusion because it's something I think that um, all everyone so far has touched on. Um, so Mark I know you're talking there about um, the role of, of TAFE being able to deliver those skills particularly for social inclusion and, and Beth as well you've touched on um, the role that your Microsoft traineeships program has had in um, really um, engaging um, diverse go co cohorts as well. So I'm wondering um, if you could um, have um, a bit of a think and um, who would like to, to get started on this particular one, but talk about how do you think the skills sector and Australian apprenticeships can really support digital inclusion uh, for all Australians? And does anyone want to get started? Mark, I can see you are almost lunging for your um, unmute button there. Yeah, well, um, I suppose, uh, yeah, I think that um, in terms of, of uh, what I've just mentioned about TAFE, um, 
a big problem, I think, with with the way the TAFE has sort of been taken out of the spotlight is is the defunding the of the, the increased defunding on over the, the last decade or more. Um, so uh, where it's where my colleague Alison Pennington has actually written about uh, the the disadvantages that that's created in the vet system, where more uh, delivery of skills and training has been um, by for profit providers, it's actually um, it's kind of undermined. I, I suppose what we're the way that we can think about we're driving towards a, a digital, digitally skilled and, and competent future uh, where all occupations and, and industries have a baseline and uh, we're not meeting those standards due to a lack of coordination. I think um, I think what digital skills that policy needs to, to reflect is um, the needs of industry policy rather than individual employers. And, uh, and I think that these things kind of go hand in hand, you know. Um, what the DSO is doing with uh, with employer-led uh, strategies needs to also be matched with um, those gaps that TAFE can fill in uh, to help to help make everything uh, coherent and 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 develop as a cohesive kind of uh, platform um, for digital skills. So a, a foundational level um, that everyone begins at. Thank you, yeah, I might just add to it. No, I, I totally agree, Mark. Um, you know, I, I remember Fathom actually produced a report for ACS um, about future of, um, you know, digital workforce or future workforce or something. And they actually said that there will be new jobs created and this many will be there and there will be, uh, you know, augmentation of existing jobs. So we need new skill sets. Um, and uh, they said, while all this is happening, there will be a skill shortage we were, and a skill gap. We won't be able to fill them. At the same time, there will be structural unemployment. And that's what happens with digital divide. And at DSU, we really want to, uh, you know, to be able to, before it becomes a structural, uh, you know, issue for the society, actually bring them and, and our models need to really cater um, to these people that that might be left behind. So, um, you know, in our pilots, the Train 100, we actually partnered with Guana Education, uh, who actually um, took a, um, a cohort of Indigenous um, students um, through that journey because we want to learn from that experience and how to really um, cater to the uh, unique needs of these cohorts. And also we had a mature age um, cohort that went through. Uh, and we know we, we connect quite closely with Goana for that purpose as well. And I mean, apart from them being very nice people, um, that um, they've just launched something with uh, ACS um, around, um, you know, around um, these um, you know, cohorts of students like women in technology and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, um, you know, coming from the vet sector, you know, I'm out of TAFE, but TAFE is not out of my uh, system. Uh, so I know that 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 um, to to bring that all together, that that um, you know, to balance that uh, employer-led training with um, the you know developing whole of individuals and making them productive citizens in this digital economy is also um, the mission of DSO. So totally, uh, our mission totally supports that as well. And can, can I just make a comment there? I do, um, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for what TAFE can do in terms of um, creating access to digital skills programs. And, um, you know, if if this solution was as easy as a, a free online course, then the problem would have been solved a long time ago because there's no end of free online courses. Um, but of course, it's never that. It's it's more about that sort of support, supported learning pathways and, and that access to even just computing equipment. That said, um, if you look particularly at the qualification that we use in our traineeship program, the completion of that is under 50%. So I personally think that um, you know that that there is something missing in in relation to getting people qualified through TAFE if that is uh, an acceptable figure through a traineeship um, model. We're sitting at about eighty percent completion, so it makes a huge difference to blend that academic learning with on the job training and support. But I also think there's a piece here around just the um, uh, the ability to pay someone as they learn and really investing in that kind of traineeship concept because there's a lot of people that we've come across who um, aren't able to afford to go to university regardless of, of HECS or any of that, that nature. Um, and so I, I think 
anything that we can do to create models um, that support people to earn and learn is, is got to be a good thing. Plus technology in particular is only, is, is best delivered in the workplace because to Gatani's point earlier, by the time that the units of competency have been prepared for the technology industry, they're out of date. Um, the technology industry moves so quickly. I just want to pick up quickly also on some of the comments um, I've seen on high schools in, in regard to this conversation. So I know um, we've certainly kind of looked at the possibility of doing high school based um, or school school based apprenticeship programs and that's sort of been on the on the radar a little bit but um, from the Microsoft perspective they they have a big program called the future skills program and there's a, a big investment in um, in uh, you know, supporting teachers to access learning materials, supporting students to access learning materials and then get micro certifications as they're going through school. And there's quite a bit of help, um, especially linked to LinkedIn, um, where there is some support around um, helping to predict and make informed choices about the things to study on the basis of the, the likelihood that those jobs will exist or be in demand in the future so that you could try and blend your learning or, and, or inform your learning as to, to your employment chances. Um, I, I, I again think that Australia could perhaps do a better job to invest in career advisors and making sure that the career advisors are informed and empowered to give people the right advice as it relates to skills and jobs of the future. I, I do wonder if perhaps uh, people kind of um, make recommendations on the basis of what was current 10 or 15 years ago and, and you know, to, to try and invest in that advice. Um, it would be a good idea to my part, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Beth. And um, I think um, your points around career advice and, and schools we'll probably get into in a bit more uh, detail as well um, later. But I think, um, you know, both of those issues are, are really big ones across the sector. And being able to give um, information, particularly to career advisors and teachers, is something that we've certainly um, found has been difficult because, um, of course, you know, they're talking with students who might not be entering the workforce for another 10 years. And it's such a rapidly changing um, environment that being able to imagine um, what might be happening in 10 years can be quite difficult if someone's really just trying to answer that that question of what job am I going to have um, when they're not really thinking about you know what skills do I need for my future as well so certainly some interesting discussions we've had in that space. Um, Can I just I have one minute just to um, just um, to say something in response to some of the chat comments? Uh, DSO is actually working on a concept called integrated digital training marketplace, and that's because in the digital space, I talked about Guan Education. Um, that's a non-registered training organization that's doing great work um, to close that digital um, divide um, as well. And, and um, there are various other organizations that we work with. So when we talk about the integrated digital um, training marketplace, it, it's about bringing the best capabilities of those people together, uh, which is why in our trials we actually had the um, Queensland TAFE, that's a public provider, and we had General um, Assembly, that's a private provider, uh, that's not an RTO, as well as um, uh, Gwen Education, that's a private provider with a very, um, you know, a focus on Indigenous and, and um, marginalised cohorts. So uh, it is in our mission to bring these sectors together and, and um, you know, have a strong sector that's agile and responsive to the industry needs. And we all bring certain strength to that sector. It's about bringing it together. So uh, I will be very um, keen to connect with uh, people who made those comments because uh, at the moment we're trying to figure out how we are going to bring this all together um, as well with the work of the DSO. Thank you. Excellent, thank you for that. And yes, and there's a lot of really interesting discussion going on in the chat. So please everyone, I am trying to keep on top of all the comments, but um, uh, please do keep replying in there. And I think um, something that um, you know has been a really go good comment that a lot of people are making um, is the fact that there are some really good quality uh, private providers as well, and that not all private providers are for profit. Um, is something that I've seen over in the, at the chat a, a comment as well. Um, and I think um, something that I'd, I'd like to pick up on is um, uh, NCBR uh, earlier this week released a uh, report um, around student equity in VET. 
Um, and uh, you can go into that interactive report and have a look at just some of the different equity groups. Um, and it's also got some data in there around um, the types of providers that um, are delivering that training. And I think what's quite interesting is that um, while TAFEs are certainly um, overrepresented in delivering uh, training to the different equity groups, um, that private training providers and our community education providers are certainly also making up um, a large proportion of those cohorts as well. And um, I think, Beth, your, your point around, um, you know, completion rates through uh, VET courses versus uh, traineeships and also then through uh, public versus private providers um, is certainly um, a really good point as well and, and being able to make those um, industry needs. So um, something that I'd like to, to uh, touch on, I think this is um, something you, you've just alluded to in your comments, is the tension that we're seeing in the apprenticeship space. And it's something that I'm seeing come through the, co the, the comments as well, um, between the, the, the fantastic ability to get employer engagement um, and those um, often increasing completion rates where you do have employers being able to train up um, staff really in the workplace um, and what, what they're needed and really being on top of, I guess, those future focused skills, because of course the employers are training their staff up um, in, in the skills that they actually need on the ground. But then we've also got a massive lag um, in training package development and um, how those courses are, are coming through. And I know it's been a comment through the VET system that, um, you know, often by the time um, a new qualification or a new course has been approved, um, that, you know, it's already out of date. And so there are really um, big challenges across the system there. So I was wondering if anyone would like to start off commenting around um, that tension between um, in the apprenticeship model between what is really fantastic with that employer engagement, but not so great at the moment um, in the fact that the training packages are potentially lagging. And I can see, Gary, you're quite happy to jump in on that one. Thanks, Peter. Um, and I guess that was probably leading to the, the real critical issues that I've a number of people in the chat room have already picked up on and I'm keen to get Chathani's views and also Beth's views on this. It's really the issue between nationally recognised formal qualifications and industry accreditation for particular skill sets or micro credentials, whatever we, we want to call it. I'd be interested in your views on what do you think employers value more and potentially what do individual students value more? So. Um, again, I'll hand over with that. It wasn't really a, a comment or, or giving an answer because I think it's we're in this space where training package development is traditionally slow, but technology is going to be going faster all the time. And I think industry accreditations, even in some industries like plumbing or automotive, you'll do your formal qualification, but then the employer is really keen on what does that industry certification look like if I'm a I'm a certified BMW technician or I become a ream hot water specialist or whatever it happens to be. Are we going to see more and more of that going forward in the future? I, I guess what we've tried to do with our traineeship program is to blend the best of both. So we use an accreditation being the Cert 4 and IT plus the industry credentials um, and certifications in Microsoft Azure. I think um, I'm I'm on the uh, industry reference council for the IT training package, and I can see it from that side of the fence as well. And just the um, the time it takes to do the industry engagement is um, it's yeah endless and frustrating, and it's often um, hard to get the industry to provide feedback to the industry reference councils because the language that those organisations are using in terms of units of competency, it's quite foreign from the actual lived experience of what it's like to, to work in the industry. So uh, it's it's a necessary evil almost. Um, but I, I, I wonder, especially if we're looking at technology um, qualifications, bearing in mind TAFE and even universities will never be able to keep up with the pace of tech and it will get faster and faster. So I wonder if we actually use TAFE to provide the foundational learning required for a career in technology, but then blend in the industry certifications on whatever flavour you choose. Th those industry certifications are going to um, remain current because the industry and the organisation have a vested interest in keeping them up to date. And they're almost a certificate of currency in that I know how to use this technology at a piece of time, in a, at, a, at a 
place in time. Um, but you've got that foundational piece of an Australian qualification, which I think is still valuable and and it's important, you know, as much as we would love to have people getting Microsoft certifications, I think there is still a lot of validity to people getting that Australian qualification as well um, and not just the industry certs. Yeah, the, the, the work um, exactly, um, you know, um, bit with the Microsoft traineeship program that that really looking at that broad based you know, ability for them to um, work in a technology center and evolve as the technology changes is what the qualification brings. And then to provide that short, sharp skills that are needed to survive in that sector uh, is what the uh, what the certifications bring in. So with the DSO trials, we're actually doing what's called qualification trials. It's, it's about qualification redesign, um, you know, looking at uh, you know, some of the challenges that Gary outlined, uh, you know, modularizing, um, so um, you know, being able to stack micro credentials, being able to get those credentials in whatever ways. Uh, we, we're looking at separating uh, you know, that that uh, entire thing about independent assessment uh, and how we bring that in as well, very, very carefully. Uh, there are lots of issues to consider there um, and things like them. So some, when the technology changes very quickly, uh, what we really want to look at and learn from the apprenticeship system is this, uh, this thing called learning in the flow of work because and, and to you know, and to be able to have a structural way to get people and get the employer commitment and learn from people like you know the work that field officers here in gtu gtu um, always are doing um, like megt field officers and people like them and then combine these for mentoring guiding and providing that structural framework for people to actually learn in the flow of work because um, and then uh, you know the, the, the vet practitioners to support that that process um, and elevate that and then map them to credentials, whether it's industry certifications, qualifications, how that happens, um, as long as it adds value. And, and I've, I'm glad that Gary talked about employer and the learner. Um, to to uh, you know adding value to the learner where where they need it so uh, it's not just skills for today it's for as they evolve in their career um, and needing to go forward with the changes in technologies that these things will take them forward as well um, so um, the recent cadetship um, budget um, um, the uh, money that was released really address some of these things and give us the opportunity to um, test how this will happen. Who will do that? We don't know, but DSO is very keen to be involved in and, and test some of these models, which has a very um, definite component of industry certifications that we can build uh, into the cadetship or qualification with VET or qualifications that go with VET and higher ed, which will be very powerful as well. And just to to pick up on an important point there, Gitani, I think this concept of lifelong learning is a, a, a call to the education sector to really rethink how they engage with their learners. And you know, gone are the days that you do a three year or four year degree or a three or four year or two year traineeship and apprenticeship and be done with education for the rest of your life. I think. We need to realise that education is now a lifelong commitment and to, in order to remain current and employable, there will be points in time where we need to kind of stop and you know, update our skills and, and do maybe short, sharp, shiny courses just to kind of get bring that currency back. Um, I, I worked with a colleague in the higher education sector who was talking a lot about, you know, universities moving towards establishing um, a, a, almost like a subscription service to educational services. So really thinking about how is there opportunity to innovate in terms of how we provide this education? I, th I think you know it's incumbent on us to really think creatively about what what we do without necessarily diluting the value and the you know the the quality of the education. But I think we need to think about how we deliver it and that lifelong commitment that we have to our learners so that we're supporting them on their in their lives, not just three years after school and, and that's it, you're done. Yes, yeah, some really good points there. So something that's coming up in the chat that I'm, I'm really interested about 
um, is there's been a lot of commentary around um, kind of digital skills and, you know, why are we still talking about them as something separate, you know, when really a lot of them are just work skills, you know, everyone needs to be able to, to use digital or have digital skills for use in work. And we've also had a question just come through um, as well around what specific digital skills will learners need to develop to be productive in the workplace? And my, my comment and question around this is, you know, what would you consider the digital skills that are needed for um, what I would call someone who's, um, you know, using tech but is not necessarily a digital worker in the sense that they're not doing that really core or high level specific digital role versus what kinds of skills do you think would need to be developed for someone to be able to go into that line of work as well? So kind of thinking a bit around, I guess, the different kind of levels or outcomes that you'd be expecting um, from a digital learner. I can take a bash at that. It's going to look very self-serving when I say Microsoft skills. <laughs> um, I guess digital productivity skills are critical for most jobs nowadays. And, you know, with a Microsoft lens, we'd be talking about using the Office 365 packages. So Microsoft Office, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, and um, now Teams. Um, we have a free course at the moment. Uh, it's called Digital Fluency, and it covers all of those types of um, productivity tools, but then also Zoom, Google Hangout, and that kind of, those kinds of connectivity um, platforms. Interestingly, um, Microsoft Excel is the world's most in-demand skill. So if you do anything, if you kind of familiarise or build up your Excel skills, you become immediately um, employable, which I think is an interesting one. You know, there's a lot of value then in doing a deeper dive into other types of foundational skills. And perhaps one of the most in-demand skills that we see going forward is data and analysis, data fluency. Um, we're generating more data than ever before, um, which is great, but most of us don't know anything about how you actually get value from that data. So I think that is um, a huge one. When we did um, this global skills announcement as well, we also looked at other types of in-demand skills and jobs, and, and there were some interesting ones there. So um, project management is huge, huge in-demand skill. Customer service is massively in demand. Um, financial analysis is heavily in demand. And then anyone kind of going into those technology disciplines would would be, um, you know, immediately employable as well. But there's a lot of foundational skills in relation to customer service and um, project management as well, which I found interesting. Yeah, just to pick up on that digital fluency piece, uh, piece um, Beth, because we DSO actually concentrates on that digital fluency um, piece to, um, you know, uh, the, to lift the um, skill level of all, all workers. And, and we look at those, uh, you consider, you talked about horizontal skills as well as vertical skills uh, that are needed. So fluency in terms of data fluency, information fluency, media fluency, collaboration fluency, uh, there's, you know, right across and, and for workers to be able to use the right tool in the right way to produce in their work context, including that attitude, the mindset, being able to use the tool, having that knowledge to use it appropriately for that work context. Uh, and, and that's the skill that we are concentrating on. So when we talk about transferable digital skills, we're talking about that digital fluency, really targeted for that worker in that environment that they need to use it as well. Yeah, excellent. And um, I know, uh, Mark, uh, throwing over to you that that's something that we uh, did look at um, a lot in the report, actually. And I know that you spent a lot of time um, delving through the literature for um, definitions around digital competency and, and those kinds of things. But what I'd actually like to ask you about is I know you had those couple of slides um, around earlier around different industries. And one that I'd like to pick up on is um, the, the piece around early childhood um, education and care, because I think, um, you know, obviously a lot of um, young people now growing up are growing up in this really digitised world and we're talking about uh, workers and a lot of it is that kind of um, pointy end, I guess, where you're going into post-school education and into the workforce. Um, but uh, what would you be thinking, um, you know, in that early childhood space around the workers and then potentially being able to pass that on um, to their students? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I've tried to think about this a little bit recently myself. Um, Apparently, uh, some early childhood education and care 
uh, workplaces are more digitally advanced than some schools. Um, I've learned that from from some industry insiders recently. Um, and I apparently that relates to things like smart boards, but it can also just relate to how um, how young learners actually uh, access information. So um, you know, I've heard colleagues talk about how it's it's almost in young people's DNA that they they think every screen is a touch screen and things like that. So they're new ways of learning. And um, and I think that that it's essential for uh, EC EC workers to to um, really what I think is is for them to understand uh, how to talk about the healthy relationship to technology uh, that that um, that that needs to that that needs to shape that to need, needs to shape that relationship with the actual use of the technologies. But um, the other schools I think relate enormously to. Uh, the, the fluency part that's about communicating uh, the understanding of the technology and, ho and holding the knowledge of the technology itself. So, so what we refer to in our um, report as um, being those those elements of digital uh, competency, for example, digital literacy, that, that you understand uh, the, the technology itself, uh, how it can be used, uh, how to access it, and you understand what its purposes are and and how it actually transforms. And so um, whatever skills, uh, which I think will largely be communicative skills in uh, ECEC, will, will actually be to uh, communicate um, that understanding to young learners as well so that they actually have a healthy relationship with the technologies um, and, and can then understand more fully that they aren't just a, you know how you how you work in workplaces, but actually how they are tools in in occupations and and a range of occupations at that, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And we've just had a, a couple of comments come through as well around you know young apprentices um, being great with apps, but not great with you know using a computer. And I know this is an issue that um, we're really seeing um, across the spectrum is that um, you know it's almost assumed that young people you know they're digital natives and they know how to use all this technology. But of course, um, a lot of the time they're um, not being taught how to use that in in terms of the application in the workplace. Um, but you know, I think there's a, the great opportunity of of being able to really consider this digital literacy space and making sure that our learners, right from early childhood through their schooling, have that basic digital literacy, so that when they do get to post school education and into the workplace, we can then um, really build up um, over that. Now, we are getting very close to three o'clock, so I'm going to just uh, finish off with uh, two quick points. So the first is just around um, this work. I know, Gary, that we're really keen to um, keep the conversation going around digital skills. Um, and so I really would um, please ask anyone that's really interested in this space um, and wants to connect up and do further work um, in this particular area, uh, we will send out the contact details, um, Gary, of, of ourselves um, after the session today. So please get in touch. Um, I'm really keen to hear more um, from everyone in that space. Gary? Thanks, Peter. Yeah, look, I was really just going to follow up on your um, comments there. We're really keen to look at how this has been applied in the apprenticeship space across different industries. I know in the chat today, there have been a few examples with AI Group and their program with Siemens. Um, we're really keen to try and flesh out other examples and what some of the good work that's been done around different parts of Australia. Um, I know in the secondary school system, they've got some good examples as well, but we're really keen to sort of see how we can apply this in that apprenticeship and traineeship area. Yeah, absolutely. And we've just had a question come through. Will there be any resources available? Um, so what we'll do is we'll definitely send around um, the, the full um, report and the blogs that we've been doing. And what we might look um, at doing after the session today, Gary, is just collating some of the uh, resources and other comments that have come through and, and putting together um, just a, a bit of a final response um, to that and send that out as well. And, um, and really then use that as a bit of a launch for the next um, phase of our discussion. And then my last uh, point, and I'll let anyone comment um, on this as well, is um, around apprenticeships. So, um, you know, we've already all touched on a few different elements of the apprenticeship system that works really well. And I know the DSO is looking at that for the, the cadetship model um, around the employer involvement and mentoring and the work of the um, ASINs and the GTOs as well. Um, so are there any kind of last thoughts that you'd um, have around what's working particularly well um, in the apprenticeship space for digital skills? And what kinds of things would you potentially like to see um, updated, changed, or where would you like to see some innovation um, for digital skills and Australian apprenticeships? Make everyone think really hard at the last moment, Gathani. 
Um, I'll, I'll just say um, the employee engagement um, that's happening right at the uh, front and then throughout the um, journey of that skilling. Uh, we need to learn from that and we need to replicate that um, across as well as to lever how to how best to leverage from that employee uh, engagement because a lot of our in the IT space we're not really utilizing that what I call the uh, learning in the flow of work we're just saying you need to come to our institution we'll teach you how to learn I mean, you know we'll teach you those skills rather than there's 70 percent of things that are happening at the workplace or 80 percent uh, if they, you know, if they at work for four days and one day at um, at the training institution, uh, we need to really leverage from that and um, um, really learn, uh, really use that employee engagement for the benefit of the training as well. Yeah, I think if I could wave a magic wand, I would. Um force the Australian federal government to impose taxes on on big business to um, you know incentivize or compel them to, to bring on trainees and apprentices I think it's too easy not for them to do it and it's um, you know that should be the the main policy piece I think just as it's been in the UK so we've in Microsoft has supported 10,000 UK apprentices and acquired digital skills across a range of disciplines and there's nothing to say we couldn't do that here we've had 20,000 people apply to our program but we've only managed to extract 250 jobs so we need big we need businesses to really step up to this challenge I also think if I was waving a magic wand I would really invest in the skills and expertise of the TAFE teachers as well and make sure that they are as current as they possibly can be to give young people every opportunity to, to be inspired by what's possible um, so those are my my two wishes great wishes for me, uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, and and building on uh, Beth's points particularly, I think that um, for me it's sort of uh, coming from from not so much the vet sector itself, but from again federal government is um is an industry policy uh, that looks towards uh, the the potential for the renewable uh, energy industries in this country and. Uh, the enormous opportunity for apprenticeships and traineeships to be created out of, of a green industrial future. Um, at the moment, uh, a gas-fired recovery is the only industry policy we seem to have, and uh, we need an industry policy that focuses on uh, manufacturing and the related services industries and, uh, yeah, things like early childhood education and care, which will be, grow in, in demand enormously and uh, and will um, help to, to nail both those uh, 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 issues of, of social policy and industrial policy because um, I think we're beginning to see that they are they are they go hand in hand and um, that's that's going to be essential moving forward. Thank you. And Gary, any last words before we all head off? And, and uh, um, apologies for running a couple of minutes over time, um, everyone. But this will be our last comment of the day, Gary. Thanks, Peter. Um, and again, I think um, Beth, you've picked up on some really good points there. It's how do we bring employers back to the vocational system? Um, alongside this work we're doing with with Peter and, and the team, we're also doing some work with PricewaterhouseCoopers and Social Ventures Australia on what will it take to bring more employers back to the vet system. Um, so we've, you know, there's a lot of money being spent on boosting apprenticeship commencements at the moment, which is a fairly substantial wage subsidy that's going to finish in March. What are we going to do after that to bring employers and keep them in the system and develop that mindset of lifelong learning and keeping people up with technology? I guess the other point I'd really like more in, input on is how do we develop those programs? I like the idea of that digital fluency. How do we develop programs that can be customised and developed that can be transferable across industries is a really good starting point that all people can apply and get to some basic digital literacy level and then they will have more specific skills that they're going to need to require after that but coming to that initial level we've, we've still got a lot of work to do before we get there beautiful thank you gary and thank you to everyone for joining us particularly our panelists today it's been a really interesting discussion and um 
uh, you know, I can see from the chat that everyone who's um, joined in has, has had a great time as well. So thank you everyone for joining us and for, um, for bringing your expertise um, along to the session. Um, and we will follow uh, the session up with an email later in the week, uh, which will also have some of those resources um, and additional information as well. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and uh, I hope everyone um, has an excellent rest of the week um, and that uh, everyone really stays safe in um, what is quite an um, unusual and evolving COVID environment at the moment as well. So stay safe and thank you everyone for joining.